Sometime around the early 2000s, I saw my first hardware hack. It was at RSA, and a friend of mine, a researcher, asked me to stop by his company's booth. As press, I frequently got pulled into various vendor booths at conferences. This is different. My friend wanted to show me a side channel attack. A side channel attack is when you infer something is happening based on an observation. Consider, most attacks you hear about are direct. Someone got into a database and they copied that database. So you see it in a log file. This is different. First of all, it involves hardware. Second, you're capturing the data in the moment. Now, in the early 2000s, we still had magnetic stripes on the back of our credit cards. And this, you would swipe at a point of sale terminal. This is pretty cool at the time, because before that, you had to give your card to the clerk and he or she would set it in a metal device and then make an imprint of the card. That's why the numbers were embossed on old credit cards. Now you could swipe your own credit card at the point of sale, and the information on track one or track two, your name, your account number, your security code, the expiration date, and so forth, would be electronically captured and transmitted directly to the credit card processor. Those early card swipers, some of them actually leaked magnetic stripe information, not from the software database, but from the hardware swiper itself. So, in a vendor booth, under a table, my friend had what I'm going to call an oscilloscope. I'm sure it had a really specific name, like the Electrospectometer 3000 or something. But, for our sake, let's just call it an oscilloscope. And he hooked it up to one of these card swipers. And when he swiped the test card, the screen lit up with peaks, where the voltage was high, and valleys, where the voltage was low. And it dawned on me, at that moment that I was literally seeing ones and zeros go across the screen, the highs and the low voltages. And by recording that sequence and playing it back, my friend, he could generate the binary equivalent of the track one data. I could see then how the threat landscape, which had been pretty confined to the world of computers and networks, was expanding and expanding real fast. Although it wasn't called the Internet of Things back then, gadgets and devices were going digital. So this was going to be a big problem. And sure enough, later that same summer, at Hacker Summer Camp, hardware hacking became its own thing. This then is the story how hardware hacking became mainstream. And the one person who, in my mind, largely drove that evolution. I'm Robert Famosi. You're listening to Error Code. My name is Joe Grand, and I'm a hardware hacker and computer engineer and teacher and uh, all-around curious technology person. Just being a technology person, however, doesn't pay the bills. Joe is also an entrepreneur. Yeah, so I, I, run, a, I run a company called Grand Idea Studio that is just me, and I really focus on teaching about hardware hacking and uh, helping people understand how attackers might approach attacking their products and uh, helping engineers sort of understand that mindset and then helping uh, the other side, the sort of uh, red team side who might want to attack products or understand the security of products in order to put them into their own facility. So sort of a teacher um, sitting on the fence between hardware hacking and you know professional product design engineering. Okay, so where to start? There are so many different ways to approach this story. I mean, Joe has done so much in his lifetime, and he's still very young. In fact, growing up, Joe was often the youngest hacker in the room. So let's start with that. So I grew up in Boston and got into the hacking community at the time, or the hacker underground, or whatever you want to call it, um, when I was seven years old. So in 1982. 1982. That was when Reagan was president. Dynasty was still a hit TV show, and really, it was the dark ages in terms of personal computers. So this is curious. How does one start down the path if not only being a world-class hacker, but also a hardware hacker at that age? I mean, back in the 1980s, it was hard enough to get a computer, let alone break down a chip. And this was a time where the only people who had computers 
you know, really had to put in the effort to have a computer. It wasn't, home, home computing wasn't like it is today. Technology wasn't like it is today. And I was just lucky that I had have an older brother who's six years older than me. And for some reason he wanted to have a computer. So my parents bought an Atari 400. Um, he, after a couple years, sort of moved into wanting to become a musician. And I just inherited our computer room, which was like this tiny room in our house with a, a wooden door as, as our desk and um, just fell in love with, with computers and the Atari 400 and the membrane keyboard and the television and basically just started collecting games, trading games with people through bulletin board systems because I had known how to connect to bulletin board systems through watching my brother. Prior to the commercial internet, there were dial-up networks. That meant that if you knew the phone number of another computer, you could put the landline receiver into a cradle dial it up, and send a 300-baud signal to and from that other computer. It was not efficient, but in its day, it was pretty remarkable. And there were these bulletin boards, more like text chats, where you would meet others and upload and download files. And if the bulletin board was local, that wasn't a problem. But if the bulletin board was across the country, well, you also had to pay long-distance telephone charges and those charges went by the minute. And that went on for a little while and then realized that, you know, long distance phone calls were expensive. So as I wanted to sort of break out of my local bulletin board area, as I got older, um, I had to figure out ways to not pay for that. And when I was 10 years old, I uh, figured out how to make my first free phone call. And that was using um, basically corporate uh, long distance, uh, I guess you'd call them account numbers. So, you know, they'd be assigned to a corporation and, and they could uh, make their free phone calls. So I was using those and, and discovered not only people trading games, but people trading information about interesting systems and interesting bulletin board systems and um, or interesting computer systems other than bulletin board systems. So just anything that was connected to a telephone line, people were curious about. There were conference call systems and, you know, sort of exploring the telephone network at that time had been done in the late 60s and the early 70s by these early phone freakers and um, you know, Steve Wozniak, Joy Bubbles, and all of these amazing sort of legendary figures in that space. Phone freaking, as it was called, was an actual thing. I mean, sure, anyone doing anything with computers would, of course, be interested in how to get the costs of connecting to a much larger corporate or university computer system down to an affordable level. You know, like free. So people shared this information. How to get long distance over the BBSs. I kind of came onto the tail end of that, of like the phone freaking world, but then the home computer world. And it was just to be able to trade information about pretty much anything that was related to technology that maybe wasn't intended for most people. Like having these bits of information was, was just fun to have. It was. And at that time, in the late 1980s, the cult of the dead cow, a hacker group out of Texas, was putting large text files on their bulletin boards. These were texts that showed how to do various things related to computers beyond how to make long-distance phone calls for free. These were texts that started to explain how computer networks actually worked. For the most part, in the early hacker world, when you learned something new, you typed it up and you put the file online for others, like Joe, to download and read. And as a kid, it just seemed normal. You know, it was like maybe other kids collect baseball cards. I collected information. And I had books, handwritten, all of my notes, you know, of every password and, and phone number and whatever else that I traded with people and just loved it. I just loved the ex exploration side of things. And uh, it just sort of evolved or devolved from there, depending on, on uh, who, you, who you ask. I'm going to argue that it did evolve. In the documentary film Code 2600, Jeff Moss, a.k.a. The Dark Tangent, founder of both DEF CON and Black Hat, said, with the advent of commercial Internet services such as AOL, everything sort of devolved with all those newbies going online to post recipes and photos and whatnot. You've got mail. But then it evolved. You could actually start to see and do things once the Mosaic browser and later Netscape arrived. And into e-commerce, you know, with SSL encryption, to buy things online. But during the 1980s, it was still largely dial-up, ASCII-generated bulletin boards. And those BBSs were where you started to find others like you. 
when I was about 15 years old, uh, I was part of a hacker group called Renegade Legion, which was a group of people from all, all over the country. We basically were, were on um, Alliance teleconferences, so these uh, group chat phone calls for hours and hours and hours and hours at a time, um, prank calling people and just having fun and trading information. It was just a great, you know, it was like, um, it was almost like a, a voice version of, you know, Discord or Slack or something, and, and it was just amazing. So, and we would write text files as well, you know, credit card fraud in the 90s and how to access credit bureau systems and things that, you know, maybe, maybe nowadays would be considered sort of malicious types of, of hacking. But for us, it was just kind of teenage juvenile delinquency, I guess, is what I call it. Remember, at this point, Joe is still pretty young, early teens and naturally rebellious. I was a troublemaker outside off of the computer anyway. And having a, a, a sort of subculture, like I, I also at the same time grew up listening to punk rock music and skateboarding and things that weren't accepted by society. So Renegade Legion was just my way of sort of participating in that. And um, yeah, so, so we thought it would be fun to, you know, I'll, I'll get together one winter break and uh, all of our parents agreed and we all all of us from all over the country flew to Michigan and hung out and had our little hacker meetup. And um, we ended up getting arrested for breaking into a Michigan Bell telephone facility, which was sort of a problem. I suppose getting arrested as a juvenile in another state and without your parents nearby, well, that would be sort of a wake up call. And that event, it really changed his view on things. And it was a real kind of game changer for me. Like the other guys were older and they actually got in significant trouble. Uh, but because I was the only juvenile, I just lucked out. And the, and the, the police and the district attorney or whoever didn't want to do an additional set of paperwork to handle like the kid. Uh, so basically the police talked to my parents and they kind of made sure that I had some more supervision. Uh, and that just changed the direction of, of what I was doing didn't, however, stop Joe from hacking. So even though I was still in love with technology, passionate about technology, and still had that mindset, but I realized, okay, I can do something constructive and positive with, uh, with this world, right? So instead of you know, ripping people off or ripping companies off, I could now discover things and explore and teach other people kind of my process. And, and that's how it, you know, that's how it all changed. That was 1992. And since then I haven't gotten in trouble, which is great. <laughs> and, um, and I still love what I do, you know, and it, I still am able to share my passion uh, about technology and about security and about hacking and about thinking differently and approaching problems differently. And uh, it really is just amazing that what started as sort of an innocent exploration of technology is now a career and there's a massive industry around it and that I'm able to make a living doing what I love. So I definitely have no complaints and, and I love telling the story because it really looking back was, um, you know, a, a rocky one, but with some really poign poignant moments that that really shaped things. So 1990, that would have predated the commercial Internet. In order to be online, that meant you had to use your telephone. And you were looking at ASCII-generated screens on a monochromatic television. And as I said, you were paying for every minute that you were online. So given where Joe was in Boston, he had the option of physically meeting his fellow hackers, not just talking with them online. Around the early 90s, a lot of us were meeting, you know, talking on bullet board systems, and we had some early meetups. I think the first one was either 1990 or 1991, that was called the ATDT Grillathon, and the Grillathon uh, was a meetup for basically a bunch of us that were on one of the local hacker bulletin board systems, and uh, and that was yeah, what was 30, 30 something years ago. And actually, one of the guys that had run ATDT, that bulletin board system, just reached out to me recently, and we were catching up on the old days. And nobody, you know, nobody expected anything to come of of that scene. We just all loved what we were doing. Joe was lucky. He was physically located in one of the hot spots for early computer development and not, say, in the middle of the country. In addition to dialing up others, Joe could literally walk out the door and meet up with them in person as well. So after I'd gotten in trouble, sort of right around that time in the early 90s, the Boston hacker scene was just really amazing. We had some really great bullet board systems. 
Um, and I think because it was a college town, uh, you know, you had MIT, Boston University, Northeastern University, uh, and a lot of mostly biotech, but a lot of technology going on in that area too. So you always had this influx of people. And, you know, MIT has a culture of hacking uh, that just kind of permeates the city and almost makes it okay, right? It makes it okay to kind of do these things that maybe are a little bit questionable, even though Boston as a whole is very much like pretty uptight, I would say. But the hackers kind of made it a little, a little better. If you want to know more about the hacker scene in Boston in the 1980s, I suggest Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, is a must read. He documents MIT's fascination with telephone switching systems and how that influenced early computer networking and computers themselves. I feel like the hacker scene in Boston kind of just formed uh, kind of organically. And it was, again, you know, people that were passionate about technology that were lucky enough to have a computer and that were interested in this stuff, but maybe not interested in the traditional uses of computers, but more of that kind of subculture aspect. Um, and it was great for me because I was always the youngest kid around. Perhaps this wasn't the supervision that the Michigan police suggested to Joe's parents, but it was a pretty good proxy. I was surrounded by people who seemed to me to be, you know, old, responsible, respectable people, even though they were only, you know, like 20 years old and I was <laughs> 14 or whatever when I first met them. Um, but it was, I, I basically was surrounded by, by mentors, whether they knew it or not. Um, so after I'd gotten in trouble, that really uh, helped me a lot to see, you know, how Count Zero and Brian Oblivion, who had formed The Loft, which was a hacker group, uh, that, that I got involved in after I'd gotten in trouble in, in 1992. And um, seeing how they would work on projects and carry themselves. And we would go to some very, some very small conferences at the time, but not even conferences, more, you know, hacker kind of gatherings. And just seeing their energy and, and how they handled themselves and, and communicated with people. Like, it was really how I learned to socialize and how I learned to, to share what I, what I enjoy doing. So there's a thread that I've noticed when talking with hackers. There's this passion for sure, but there's also this joy, which doesn't get mentioned as much. They enjoy taking things apart and learning about them. So right about now is the pivot. You've got Joe in and among people in this community, and they're doing the typical network stuff. They've got their Linux machines. They're opening up protocols, and they're looking at this, that, and the other thing. And then there's Joe taking apart the TV. I mean, how do you get hardware hacking out of these other people? Right. So, yeah, at the time, most of the hacking was program related, software related, network related. Um, but I had always just loved electronics Re separate from hacking. You know, I, I had always just read electronics magazines. I would build projects out of magazines. Uh, and hacking was never a, a potential career path. But I had always known I was going to be an engineer. Like even when I was a kid, it was, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be an engineer. I want to build products. I want to build electronics. Um, so it was sort of a parallel effort of doing electronics and doing hacking. Uh, so when the loft came about, a lot of the guys were, were you know, finding vulnerabilities in, in Windows machines. They were setting up Novell netware to play Doom and all of these things. Uh, and I was just, you know, interested in, in electronics and building projects. And then it slowly started kind of going into, okay, maybe instead of building products, like let's look at existing products and see if there's problems in them. And as luck would have it, Brian Oblivion, one of the founders of The Loft, also was an engineer and was into that world. So he, again, became a mentor for me while all the other guys were, were doing their other stuff. So Loft Heavy Industries, that's spelled L-0-P-H-T, was the Boston equivalent of Cold of the Dead Cow. Okay, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that, but it's true that the Loft was a bit more commercial, a bit more professional. In fact, it was sold to At Stake and then Symantec. And some of the Loft's original members, Chris Eng and Chris Weisopel, they went on to form successful companies themselves. And other alumni includes Peter Zacko, a.k.a. Mudge, and Space Rogue. Loft is perhaps most famous for addressing the 1998 Senate Governmental Affairs Committee. Here's Chairman Fred Thompson reading them into the record. If you uh, gentlemen would come forward. 
We're joined today by the seven members of the Loft uh, Hacker Think Tank in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, due to the sensitivity of the work done at the Loft, they'll be using their hacker names of Mudge, Weld, Brian Oblivion, Kingpin, Space Rogue, Tan, and Stefan. Gentlemen, <laughs> I uh, I hope my grandkids don't ask me who my witnesses were today and <laughs> say Space Rogue. Remember the bit about Joe being into skateboarding as a kid? Well, that's where he got the hacker nickname. Kingpin, that's not a mafia reference. That's the bolt that runs through the truck or axle of a skateboard. It was at this hearing that members of the loft more or less said that they could shut down the internet in about 30 minutes. Tucked into that was the testimony of a young Kingpin. Good morning. My name is Kingpin. I am the youngest member of the loft and one of the electrical engineers and hardware hackers. Uh, while some of the loft members concentrate on software programming, I work with hardware design and implementation of electronic circuits. My interests include embedded system design, surveillance and counter surveillance tools, and wireless data transmissions. My current research project involves experimentation with the monitoring and eavesdropping of stray electromagnetic fields from computer terminals, otherwise known as Tempest monitoring. Using low-cost electronic equipment, one can capture the contents of computer screens from more than 200 meters away, possibly gaining passwords and other sensitive information. The phenomenon of Tempest monitoring has been known to the industry for decades, but there's not much unclassified information available on how to both capture the emissions and also protect oneself from becoming an eavesdropping victim. My research will not only help me learn about the monitoring technology, it will enable me to educate others to help them protect their computer systems from prying eyes. What Joe's talking about, Tempest, was a government program that allowed surveillance by inferring data from unlikely sources. For example, one project could pick up voices by studying the vibrations of a pane of glass in a conference room. Another could read the computer terminals facing windows from a significant distance. Even cooler, they could read the displays on terminals facing away from the windows by looking at people's glasses. So the details of what Tempest did was slowly leaking out, and Joe he was just trying to figure out how he could recreate some of that research himself. Funny side story. The very first hacker summer camp that I attended was in the summer of 2000. At that time, Black Hat was at Caesars Palace. And the conference and the conference space at Caesars, it was pretty small. Maybe a few hundred people. I didn't necessarily know anyone back then. So at lunch... I found a table for 10 with about seven people already seated, and I asked if I could join them. See, I was attending Black Hat as press from ZDNet, and as would be expected, there was a brief exchange of glances from one to the other until finally one of them said, he's cool, so I sat. The seven concluded their respective meals shortly thereafter and got up and left. A few minutes later, someone sat down next to me and said, so, you were having lunch with the loft? I think I spat out my water. Years later, I told the story to Joe, and it was clear that the event had more meaning to me than it did to him. Oh, and the person who said, he's cool? That was Peter Zyko, a.k.a. Mudge. So even though the software hacking and the network hacking was capturing the news, this was also the beginning of hardware hacking. In many ways, Loft was perhaps the birthplace of hardware hacking that we know today. It was Brian and Joe uh, were the were the hardware guys in the Loft, and um, it was it, it was uh, yeah it wasn't really that accepted, you know, like hacking on hardware. Like people didn't really understand what we were doing, uh, and they loved it. You know, like the media would come and and they would. They, they'd like have their cameras showing up, showing off the loft and we would, you know, cause we were kind of a, an odd specimen, you know, seven hackers in a clubhouse doing this stuff for fun. Um, all the other guys had jobs. I was still in, in high school and then in college. And then, you know, I was still involved when I became a professional engineer 
everyone is always fascinated with hardware because it's it's vi visual, right? You can see it, you can see what happens with it. But it wasn't really that accepted, I would say, in the in the space. You know, like we w a lot of people would have ham radios, and you could modify your ham radios to to um, listen in on uh, on communications or transmit out of drive-through speakers and things. So there was a little bit of hardware in the scene, but not a lot of people kind of modifying or, or manipulating hardware. So there was some modding going on. People would take the device and modify it in some way, but they weren't exactly taking the devices apart to better learn or understand what was going on inside. I think it just over time, as I started sharing stuff, like I don't exactly know when it became more common, but I've always, you know, since the beginning, oh, have just always driven that fact of like, yeah, software is important, network's important, all of these things are important to to, fo to look at for security, but same with hardware. Like, we just trust hardware like it's a magic box that does something for us, and we don't think anything about how it was built, or how it operates, or what, you know, features uh, developers or administrators left in there or, or manufacturing left in there to make testing easier that we could exploit. So people weren't really thinking about that fact, but I feel like for a while I was just kind of yelling it and, you know, I'd get a couple people here and there to talk that would, uh, that would be like, yeah, man, like that hardware. Um, but I really think it wasn't until probably like the mid 2000s when hardware became another uh, element of computer security, right? Or element of hacking. So it, had, it was its own it was its own niche at that point. So I've been going to Black Hat for some twenty some years, and you're right. It was right around 2003 that I remember seeing Joe up on stage in a packed ballroom at Caesars, standing there with this garage shirt that had Joe stenciled on it. It was a nine X, a nine X logo, the New York New England Exchange Bell logo. Yeah, the garage shirt. That's <laughs> I still I still have it, and it still fits. It seemed like hardware hacking wasn't yet a track. It was probably just a talk or two. That's right. And and that, yeah, so my first talk at Black Hat uh, was 2001 with Brian Oblivion about, the, the name was Secure Hardware Design, but it basically was about ways you could attack products and, and try to at least make them more secure. And um, yeah, there was no hardware track. It was just, it was hacker security related, right? And um, And, but the dark tangent, who had started Black Hat had this vision, like he could see it, he got it. And so when he started that track and sort of opened it up, it was like the, you know, if you build it, they will come. And now it kind of legitimized that track of like, okay, you can do hardware and, and people. And what I found also is a lot of people who were in the software world eventually kind of got burned out with that and they wanted to try something new. So they kind of moved over to the hardware space um, and it started becoming, you know, really interesting. Back in those early days, there were still a handful of tracks at Black Hat and DEF CON. So having a Windows track, that was pretty exciting. So getting a hardware track, that's even more exciting. But that's when things really started to escalate for Joe. In 2005, Jeff Moss, the Dark Tangent, when he started doing trainings at Black Hat, was like, hey, Joe, like, uh, I'm starting to do trainings. You should do one about hardware hacking. And... It was still at this time, I was like, really? Like, do you think people would want to actually sit through a class on it? He's like, yeah, let's just try it. So I put together a class and um, taught it. I think the first time that I taught it was in, at Black Hat Europe, maybe, to seven people. So it was a little bit of a trial. And then we did it in, in the US and it maybe was 18 people. And then the year after that, it was sold out at 24 people and sold out every year pretty much since whatever it was, 2000 six or seven at that point up until today. So it really is pretty cool that, that he sort of saw this vision in, in the computer security world where I had, you know, I don't have that sense. Like I'm not a, a business person. Like I just do what I love to do. And the fact that people are willing to, to learn from my experiences is amazing. Um, but, and when I put the course together, it was like, all right, let's just share my process of how, how I like to look at things. And uh, that's pretty much been the foundation of of everything I've done since then. So with hardware hacking came the need to pioneer a lot of original tools necessary to deconstruct circuit boards, not just soldering irons, but actual tools to help understand what was going on inside the chips. This is where Brian and Joe could really make their mark. 
I think the I think what we did mostly is kind of break that glass ceiling, if you will, right? Like let people know that hardware is an area that you can explore. And it was hard to get equipment back then. So at the loft, you know, we were near MIT. So we would walk through the tunnels of, of MIT and pick up discarded equipment and go through the dumpsters of, of businesses in the area and rebuild computers. Dumpster diving, not just for paper punch cards and printouts with social security numbers, phone numbers, and credit card numbers, but hardware as well. And a year before that Senate testimony, here's Joe on local New England cable TV. The amazing thing about all of this is the equipment these good pirates use. Junk. When it's nice out, we go trashing a lot, and uh, we used to go around on bicycles before. A lot of people had cars, and now luckily they have cars, so we drive around. And um, a lot of, we, we go to a lot of flea markets and pick things out. Things are old computers that used to play games, CB radios, and circuit boards. Everything from Apple IIs to a Vax computer. Kingpin, who has been modifying electronic stuff since he was seven, will soon have a degree in computer engineering. He is much more interested in what college didn't tell him. A lot of stuff you just have to play around with and explore. And, and you know, same with the software all the exploits and the bugs, you don't see that in the manuals because people don't know about it. You just have to play around it until you find them. There was the MIT flea market that you could trade equipment where we met, you know, uh, a young Windows Snyder and a young Limor Freed who started Adafruit and all these early hackers. If those names are unfamiliar to you, Windows Snyder is the CEO of Thistle. And before that, she was head of security for Square, Apple, Fastly, Intel, Mozilla, and Microsoft. Lamore Freed, she's the CEO of Adafruit, hacking company that makes unique DIY electronics for makers of all ages. So I think we just, you know, we were kind of harvesting equipment, fixing it, and setting up our own things. And I think we just showed that it was okay to do that stuff, right? And, and I think that made people maybe a little more comfortable. And uh, yeah, I think just doing what, what we love to do, I don't really have any other explanation for it. Like it just kind of, it, to me, it feels like it just kind of happened. But the tools Joe built for his work at Loft and other opportunities that came later were largely for himself. Getting tools for others? Oh, that came later. Much later. Well, that's true, right. So so the access to tools was tricky. Uh, And we were using discarded equipment. Getting legitimate engineering tools was expensive. You know, like you couldn't just buy an oscilloscope because they were too much. You couldn't just buy a logic analyzer. It would have been $50,000. Um, so we, we started building some of our own tools. I didn't really start building tools that would be useful for the, for sort of general population of hackers until probably 2010. Um, but we basically just got by with what we could. Some of the hardware tools he built for himself were rather niche. I do remember building some you know, like an I2C interface to a parallel port. So basically to let us use our computer to communicate to individual chips on a board. And I2C is like a very common inter-chip communication protocol. So kind of building these things, kind of ad hoc engineering tools as we needed them. Uh, but yeah, we didn't really consciously say like, we're going to build tools and, and market those or anything. His next tool, however, was more common and more universal in its need. Uh, but that wasn't until like 2013 when I created the JTagulator, uh, which is a device that would basically let people connect up to a bunch of unknown test points or connectors on a circuit board and help them identify, is that a debug interface like JTag, which is kind of like the, the hardware equivalent of root. Like if you have access to JTag or any other debug interface, you pretty much win because you can control everything about the hardware. Uh, and it will help find serial port interfaces that could be used for shell access or console access or debug logs, and it will help find ARM serial wire debug. So building this tool kind of as a way to close this gap between finding interesting things on a circuit board but not knowing exactly what to do and how to proceed, which came directly out of, out of my teaching because I could sort of see the students realize like, okay, this is a lot of work, right? Like it, to me, it seemed normal of like, okay, you, you do this, you pull the pins high, you search here, you try this. But most people didn't have that, that I guess maybe um, the, the understanding yet or the knowledge to do that. So this tool was one, I guess you could say it was an early, an early hardware hacking tool or an early tool specific for hardware hacking uh, to get people involved in it. 
this is how Joe became the reluctant entrepreneur, now selling hardware hacking tools. I made a hundred of them to sell at DEF CON. I think it was DEF CON 14. And figured I would just sell them out of my bag and then just be done with it. And it's, you know, make it open source and be done. And it's now nearly 10 years later and they're still being manufactured and still being sold. So again, a detagulator is a tool that allows you to identify on-chip debugging interfaces from test points via computer pads or connectors on a target. Remember, Joe taught himself how to do this on his own. He then realized he could help others by making a tool that would do that for them. It's cool to see that and see people, you know, when you watch a talk, oh, I tried to use the JTagulator to find the interface, and then I did that to do this. So kind of creating tools that help people achieve a goal is, like, surprisingly cool. And I, I wasn't expecting to feel that way about it. I was like, okay, I'm just going to make this because, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, and then to see that engineers use it to verify if their systems are secure. So I don't know. It was, it was another one of these sort of unplanned things of like, I'm going to make something that's useful to me and release it, put it out in the world. And if it's useful to other people, then great. In his talks at Black Hat and DEF CON with his classes, did Joe ever discover other hardware hackers? Yeah, I think the finding other hardware hackers... At first, it was like discovering bulletin board systems when I was a kid, right? Because you would find one, and when you're on that bulletin board system, you realize there's other hackers, there's other people like you, and you sort of found your people. Um, so hardware was kind of that same way of like when you started, at least when I started, you know, giving talks about it, then people would email me and say, hey, that, you know, cool talk. Yeah, I think just little by little, there started to be more and more people coming out doing, doing hardware. Okay, now the floodgates have really opened. And with DEF CON 14, that was when this idea of badge life began. And I think another real turning point was the electronic badge for DEF CON. Basically, every conference needs to have some sort of badge to show who paid to attend. For DEF CON, these have always been minimalist. No names, no corporate titles, no advertising. That's not to say the badges themselves weren't interesting. For example, I have a badge from DEF CON 9, which is a yellow-green liquid gel in a soft plastic container. Keep that in mind. Meanwhile, Joe, he needed to create a project for his class. And, and that one was something where, again, another completely just organic thing. Um, in my training class that the Dark Tangent suggested I do, I needed to create some sort of platform that I could use for people to learn how to do various electronics and hardware hacking skills. So soldering and desoldering and modifying the board and monitoring signals and, and all of these things. So I built my own custom little circuit board that had a bunch of hidden puzzles in it. Sort of like what you would say, you'd think about now as like, um, you know, sort of a, a hardware capture the flag type of thing. And uh, except there wasn't, wasn't a name for it back then. Um, so I built this, this circuit board and it was in the shape of my logo of my company, which is like a G with an exclamation point in it. Badge life today has taken on its own meaning. Villages at DEF CON produce and sell their own custom circuit board badges, and there are badge swaps. But at DEF CON, there's always been some macro games being played. The program books, for example, would have challenges, codes, and sometimes you saw mandalas on the floor of the hotel, and these were clues. One year, though, the badges at DEF CON was a vinyl record. So a bunch of hackers went down to Fry's in Las Vegas and bought turntables with USB ports so the music on the badge could be converted into digital signals, which would help them unlock the puzzle. So after teaching for a couple of years, the Dark Tangent was like, you know, he had seen it over the years. He's like, hey, we should make one of those for DEF CON. And that was it. Just like, we should make one of those for DEF CON. And, 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 and we did. So sort of... That was the time where, still, hardware, again, was few and far between as far as talks. There was no hardware hacking village. There was no badge life or anything like that. And we thought it would be a good idea to create, you know, a simple electronic badge to expose people to hardware. And what better way than do it at a conference where there's, I think at that point, 6,000 people, where even if only a small percentage of them actually do something with the badge, everybody has one and everybody, you know, is going to look at it. And then some percentage are going to be like, that's cool. I want to try to hack it. And somehow this circuit board that Joe initially built for his training class became the official badge at DEF CON for something like five years. 
So I built this, you know, very simple artistic kind of design board in the shape of a DEF CON logo and it had some blinking lights on it. And I used a tiny six pin, I believe, microcontroller, a PIC, microchip PIC 10F uh, 202, I think it was, really tiny, very resource constrained microcontroller. And it just had a button on the badge and you'd press the button and the lights would blink in different sequences. sequences. And uh, it had a, a debug connector on there. So you could actually use some hardware tools and change the code if you wanted to and kind of experiment with it. So we, along with releasing the badge, decided to have like a badge hacking contest and see what people could do. So sort of offering these things to get them excited, which is really what the hacker community has always done and what DEF CON has always done is like, if somebody's into something, you kind of open it up to other people and, and share it and see how it grows, right? Whether it's lock picking or biohacking or whatever. And then these little communities start building from that. And this badge, which surprisingly, like people thought was was really cool. And the early puzzles in the badges, they were kind of basic too. As people got used to the idea of hardware hacking, though, it really took off. And people started hacking on it. And we had a lot of submissions that year. I mean, a lot, probably 10, um, which was not bad. And uh, which was what, 1.1% one, you know, or something like that. It was, it was an actually like good response. And that sort of showed, okay, people are, people are curious about this. And then over the next five years, so the next four iterations of DEF CON that I was involved in, in designing the electronic badge, you know, it would get a little more advanced, a little, little more kind of featureful, more design work, and people's skills started getting better and better. So the hacks were getting better. At DEF CON, registration is divided into different groups. There's human, which is the large bulk of the conference attendees. There's Goon, which are staff, and they're the volunteer guards that corral people through the hallways and protect the speakers. So there's the speakers. And there's also press along with other designations. So right there, that's like four different flavors of DEF CON badges. But up until 2015, the badges didn't really contain embedded circuits. There was also a period when the DEF CON badges themselves had to be connected to different badges. One year, I was both a speaker and press, and therefore I had two badges that people wanted to connect with. What was really cool, maybe a side product of the whole thing, was I met a lot of interesting people this way. Maybe that was the idea. And then you started seeing as circuit board manufacturing and the, the engineering design tools started getting more accessible and you weren't st stuck having to deal with like professional design tools, but you could use some open source packages and some hobbyist packages, you started seeing people creating their own badges to bring to DEF CON and trade with people and, um, and hack on. And then that sort of turned into what we now know as badge life, uh, where it's basically an entire sub conference within DEF CON of people designing badges of various functionality and various features and trading those. And it's really like an amazing thing. And the artwork on these are amazing. So I, I, I do think that, that those early badges at DEF CON were probably more significant than probably the early talks at Black Hat because it just got a lot of people really curious. And because we made it accessible and it was something that they could mess with that was very simple and they weren't gonna you know, break something at home, uh, it, just, it just worked, you know? And, and, it, and it grew from there, from, from a table in the vendor area for people to hack on badges turned into the hardware hacking village, which turned into now the soldering village and the hardware hacking village and the car hacking village. And, you know, everything pretty much nowadays, unless you're dealing with like pure network, um, has some electronic and hardware component to it, which is really cool. So yes, yeah, so you can use these skills across like all these different elements. So given this newfound accessibility to hardware hacking, what then is the barrier to entry for someone who wants to start out? Or they hear this podcast and they're thinking, how much is it going to set them back to get started on hardware hacking? So the good thing is the, the barrier to entry with hardware now is extremely low. There are so many resources online uh, that you could even start learning about hardware hacking without having any physical stuff. You know, you can read papers, you can watch presentations. Um, you know, my course, sometimes I teach them at, at public events that are... Uh, you know, for schools or for um, college kids or younger. Um, but it is, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times people can't come to a class, which is fine because 
almost everything that I do is available on my website anyway, and my class really is just all of my work over the past however many years kind of conglomerated into this thing. This is the remarkable thing about the InfoSec community, the willingness to share. It goes back to the very early days when bulletin boards were filled with posts from various people who'd figured out how to do something and wanted to share that with everybody. They didn't charge anything. They simply wanted more and more people to discover what they had discovered and also add to the larger body of knowledge. That said, you will eventually have some tools. And here, Joe is a valuable resource for that. So you can just go to my website and read about different hardware hacking and different tools to use to get some equipment. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it's $100 for a soldering iron and some of the, some of the basic tools. You might need to, uh, to have a logic analyzer to be able to monitor signals. That might set you back depending, you know, you could buy some, really you could buy knockoff stuff for like $5 on AliExpress. Um, or you could get some, some good off the shelf tools for a couple hundred dollars and start there, but you really don't need much. And there's some really good groups out there like the Exploiteers, uh, which I, I always shout out and I'm not even sure how active they are um, right now, but they're a group of people that hack all sorts of different devices and have a great website that shows different consumer devices and the different types of attacks that they've done. And it's, it's, very, it's a great accessible way to, to get involved because you can say, okay, I'm going to look through their website and, oh, I want to hack the Amazon Fire. Like, let's see what they did and let's replicate that. Sort of like when I was a kid, you know, typing programs out of magazines or building projects out of magazines um, because it's totally fine to replicate someone else's work. And that's how you start, right? You build on that. Uh, so there's just so much information and so many resources and, you know, um, so many ways to get hardware and to get the hardware tools that, yes, maybe it's not as as accessible as pure software because then all you need is a computer. That said, Joe doesn't want to discourage anyone, not because of the perceived skills gap or lack of equipment. Uh, but it definitely, like the, the bar to entry or whatever, it, you know, is the barrier to entry is um, definitely low and it's a great time to get involved and there's some amazing tools besides just regular engineering tools uh, like there's amazing tools being created by hackers for hackers to, to basically help you with traditionally like really advanced type of uh, advanced types of topics that used to require lots of math and expensive equipment that you can now do with some Python scripts and some hardware uh, to you know, do fault injection and side channel power analysis and things that basically like blow most products completely out of the water. Um, so it really is, it, it's quite a time to get involved. There's another side is hardware hacking. There's the side that says that you have the right to repair your device. One, one thing that, that I feel is really special with the hacker community, at least the hacker world that I grew up in, you know, was very... Um, kind of anti-authoritarian, ask questions, push the limits. Uh, you know, most of the people that were involved back in the day, if you think of like some of the guys in the cult of the dead cow, like some very colorful characters that weren't quite fitting the mold of the general population. And I think a lot of us were like that, whether we looked that way or not. Sometimes I sit in talks at ShmooCon or DEF CON, and I try to describe in a few words how people look in the room. And it's hard. You have a handful of people with dyed hair, but you also have them seated next to people in business attire. And it's extremely casual, at least in Vegas, where the t-shirts and jeans and flip-flop. My point is, take someone like B2 O'Rourke. Does he look like a hacker? No. But he was a part of the cult of the dead cow. And Mudge? He was a part of Loft. Not perhaps the look you expected. It isn't the hoodie. It isn't the suit. It's the way of thinking. So I've always carried that with me as far as, you know, as, as industries start getting bigger, as corporations start getting involved in things and technology growing, I'm always kicking the beehive. And I, and I have no problem saying what needs to be said and challenging somebody on something because I have nothing to lose, right? I mean, this is what I do. Like, I, it's not like I'm, I'm faking this. Like, I grew up as a hacker and I'm still a hacker. So when we see issues come up like right to repair, where basically is corporate lobbyists um, and, and, and government lobbyists uh, 
trying to make it harder for consumers to use technology that they own uh, just kind of frustrates me, I guess you could say, in the, in the kindest sense, the gentlest sense. Right to Repair is a growing movement in the hackerspace. Hackers in nearly all 50 states have lobbied their state legislators for the right to repair devices that customers own. This can be as small as your iPhone or as large as that John Deere tractor you see at the local farm. Device manufacturers are making it hard, making it so that if you tamper with the device that you own, you immediately avoid the warranty or make it so that you can only take that device to an authorized dealer or have a representative make a house call, which is ridiculous. In Massachusetts, the Right to Repair initiative has won several victories, including the right to take your now mostly computerized car to an auto dealer of your choice, not just the OEM dealer where you bought it. You know, it's like when I used to rip off the phone company or rip off credit card companies. To me, it was like a faceless act of these huge corporations. And now I see that these huge corporations actually have have direct control of a lot of what we do. And they have they have a direct say in like, yeah, you can buy something, but it doesn't mean you can do anything with it. Like you have to do what we tell you to do with it. And I've never been one to to have somebody tell me what to do and 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 gracefully do it. So yeah, with right to repair, you know, you, you, there's this there's this problem where the corporations who are manufacturing these products want consumers to buy the product and want them to use it in a certain way, and then try to protect that usage legally. And they say, you don't own the product, you're just licensing this from us, you're borrowing this hardware, um, which I think is complete BS. And here's where the hacker spirit of going up against technology companies has matured. While some hackers were doing this so that they could continue to hack their cars that they own, some are actually doing it for the rest of us as well. You buy something, you should own it. Uh, we're seeing now so much of this, I don't remember what it's called, but kind of this, this um, kind of piecemeal licensing happening where, you know, instead of just buying a cable TV service, you know, now it's internet streaming and you have to basically pay for each streaming channel that you want. Or automotive industry where you have to pay for your heated seat option and everything is becoming a pay-as-you-go a la carte which is basically like a rental service. Um, and when it comes to, like it's kind of sort of trickling down to consumer devices, to farm equipment and automotive and everything that used to be repairable by the, by the owner. Like you would buy something and you would get schematics, you would get a service manual and people would be able to fix their own stuff. But the corporations now want to you know, maintain that, that control of usage and they want to make it as hard as possible for somebody to repair their own device. It's a huge problem. The John Deere company is a good case study for this, and I might tackle it on its own in a future episode of Aerocode. Basically, if a John Deere tractor breaks down in a field, a farmer can't go and fix it on their own or call a local mechanic. No, they have to go through John Deere, and they have to get a licensed representative to come out and effectively mm, reboot the tractor. Meanwhile, the crops aren't getting harvested, the rains are coming, and the farmer stands to lose profits for the year. And, you know, being a hardware hacker and knowing how to repair this stuff and being able to teach other people how to repair it, but then not having the resources for somebody to do it in, in, in an easy way is, is incredibly frustrating and, and very wasteful. And, you know, the corporations are focusing on profits, not on really making a better future for people. Yeah, I mean, it's a whole, you could unwrap, you know, right to repair problems for, for days. Um, but for me, really, it comes down to big corporations trying to control how I use stuff that I buy. And to have an opportunity to go up against big corporations or to have a debate against a, uh, a figurehead that's lobbying against the right to repair, like, to me, that, that's the most exciting part, right? Of like trying to stand up to kind of bullies, really. R liars is what it is. I mean, and they're, they're straight up lying about um, why, why they should not support right to repair. Among the arguments against repairing your own device is that you might cause a fire or otherwise inflict personal injury if you attempt to repair something by yourself. Of course, these are extremes. And these arguments 
They're a way for the vast corporations to maintain their monopolies on the market. And it works. Know anyone who repairs their own Apple computers? No, I didn't think so. This interview, by the way, was conducted immediately before DEF CON 30, where Joe was on a panel discussing the right to repair. And at DEF CON coming up, we have a panel with Paul Roberts and, and Louis Rossman and um, Corian from the EFF trying to sort of rally people at DEF CON because the hacker community traditionally came from that world of kind of fighting the system, right? Hack the planet. And um, so trying to kind of rally people and realize like, this, these, these lobbyists and politicians are kind of using the hacker world, using security as one of the major excuses of why people should not be allowed to repair their own stuff. Basically saying, well, that could affect security. Or they're saying, well, it, you know, people aren't skilled enough. It's too confusing, uh, too dangerous. You could puncture your battery and start a fire. And, you know, all of these kind of fear tactics, you know, FUD, as we would say, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And... The mainstream populace uh, who doesn't necessarily understand security and understand hacking and understand electronics and understand technology fall for that. So it's kind of our responsibility to stand up and, and fight, against, uh, fight against this because really it affects all of us. It affects the end users, um, you know, mom and dad, but it also affects us as hackers because if some of these laws don't get passed, then eventually it will either continue to be or maybe even even more so, uh, you know, illegal to modify your devices to hack on them for research or good faith. And, you know, we're, we're getting some wins once in a while, but it's still a, a, a really hard uphill battle to go against professional lobbyists who are who are being paid by these massive corporations to convince politicians to prevent us from modifying our things or fixing our things. I wrote about Joe in my first book, When Gadgets Betray Us. I wrote about the summer in 2009 when Joe had unlimited free parking within the city of San Francisco, where he lived at the time. Joe, working with two other researchers, had turned his attention to the 23,000 smart parking meters being installed around the city as part of a $35 million pilot project. One flaw they discovered allowed them to increase the value of the plastic one-time payment cards. He also found that he could freeze that maximum value, not have it decrease with each use, and thus make the one-time card eternal. The first mechanical parking meter, by the way, was installed in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, on July 16, 1935. At that time, it was a brilliant device. A coin inserted to the appropriate size slot rolled through the channel until it hit a button that recorded within the unit the value of that coin. A timer then marked down the number of minutes allotted to that value until another coin was inserted. For roughly 60 years, parking meters on the streets worldwide worked in this way. The digital system replaced the coins with plastic cards valued at amounts, say, $20 or $50. In San Francisco, a conscious decision was made not to link all the parking meters together wirelessly in a grid because the city wanted to retain its army of parking meter collectors. To collect the fares, these workers then would zap each meter with a specialized PDA. At first, Joe wanted to get his hands on one of those PDAs, but could not. Instead, he focused on the publicly available parking meters. So they bought a bunch of cards and used various acids to boil off the layers of resin encasing the circuitry inside. Once Joe exposed them, he could then read the electrical designs on the various circuits and extract the firmware code. Armed with that code, Joe could then monitor how much each parking meter decreased the value of the smart card with each use. Armed with a special shim and a pocket-sized oscilloscope, Joe stood there on the sidewalk with a metal card jammed into the parking meter, wires trailing out until he could better understand the card's internal logic. Later that same summer, Joe responsibly reported his findings to the San Francisco Municipal Transit Authority, or SFMTA, which listened politely. Joe said in a talk at Black Hat later that year, the local authority acknowledged that the San Francisco system did in fact have such flaws, but at the end of the day, the authority told him it wasn't interested in defending against high-tech attacks, that the local authority was more concerned about people who didn't pay at all. 
Looking back over this history, it seems like a bit of serendipity then has propelled hardware hacking forward. It's sort of like a sign of kind of, you know, what's to come, right, of technology and everything. Like in your book, it's sort of like technology is everywhere and there's, there's problems with things that we, that we don't see and there's problems with things that we do see. But now there's enough people involved that we can really kind of shake the, shake the world with getting people to question hardware and force vendors to design better hardware, uh, just like we were doing with software 20 years ago. It's starting to become, in the engineering world, security is starting to become a little more acknowledged. During Hacker Summer Camp, there are a lot of distractions, a lot of things to do and see. And it's not like the early days when there was simply network hacking or maybe Windows hacking. Now, with all the villages at DEF CON, there are some variety of interests represented. For somebody who's curious about getting involved in, in hacking, I, I can see how um, overwhelming it can be these days. And I've heard that from people. And I get a lot of email from people saying, how can I be a hacker? Um, how do I get involved in this? What do I do? And like, I always just say, like, just follow your heart, as cheesy as that sounds. Right? True. Becoming a hacker isn't something you study in college or necessarily get hired to do. It's something that you do on your own, nights and weekends. Find what you love and do it. And because there's so many different areas of hacking now, it's impossible to be aware of everything. And even when I come to Black Hat now, seeing how it's changed over 20 years, um, it's completely overwhelming. And I just sort of focus on the stuff that I love and try to block out all of the, the noise, you know, keep the signal level high. And for someone just showing up for the first time at Hacker Summer Camp or any hacking get together, what advice would Joe offer them? I think it really comes down to like, you know, don't, don't, be, uh, don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to fail because failures really are more interesting than the successes a lot of times. And sometimes we miss that, you know, like we see presentations that say, I hacked this, I hacked that but we never see the real process. Um, so I think, I think the, the reality is not always what we see and people maybe get a little bit worried about feeling they're not as good or imposter syndrome or, or whatever it is. But I, I, I personally still feel that there's you know, room in, in this community for everybody and whatever, whatever you bring, as long as you're passionate, uh, join us. I'd really like to thank Joe Grant for taking the time at Hacker Summer Camp to talk about his life and the origins of hardware hacking as we know it today. If you want to learn more about Joe's work, go to grandideasstudio.com. All of his resources are posted there. And if you can find it on YouTube or Amazon Prime, check out Joe's TV show that was on the Discovery Channel back in 2009. It's called Prototype This. And more recently, Joe started a YouTube channel of his own, posting his own videos, such as his recent hacks on some cryptocurrency cold wallets. Can he recover the forgotten password worth up to $2 million on a cold wallet? Well, you'll just have to watch to find out. Hey, I'm just getting started with error code. DM me at Robert Vimosi on Twitter and tell me what you like and even what you don't. I want to hear from you. DM me at Robert Vimosi at infosec.exchange on Mastodon or at Robert Vimosi on Twitter. Some great episodes coming up that deal with security risks in quantum computing, agriculture 4.0, the Vastamo data breach, and the world of IoT and medical devices. Subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform. I don't want you to miss out. <laughs>